I'm here at the World Economic Summit 2018 with Professor Wendy Carlin from UCL, a leading member of the Core Foundation, just after her speech. Professor Carlin, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Okay, so I just wanted to start with a little bit of background on probably what you're most famous for, the Core Project. I was interested in how it came about, what the motives were for you and your colleagues in writing it. I think there are two big motivations. One was it came out of the financial crisis and the sense that economists were under a huge amount of criticism and uh, there was a sense that we could do much better and that much of contemporary economics research was not making its way into the classroom. So we, we were very motivated to, uh, to bring the best of economics to the classroom. And the second motivation was completely different. It, it came from Chile. Uh, where there were strikes going on in, in secondary schools. So the schools were shut down. And this was really a big protest about inequality in the education system. And the economic students well, from the university had gone out to support the high school students. And then they went back to the university and said, well, why aren't we learning anything about this? We, we, we're covering none of the, this important topic about inequality in our studies. So those two threads really came together and that also captures the global character of the project. Oh, interesting. And building on that, how would you say that the textbook does exactly that? It encapsulates the real world in a way that motivates students. If we were trying to make more textbooks like the Core Economics textbook, how would they teach real world economics better? The key is to begin with the problem in the world. So start, motivate what you're trying to teach by finding a real example in the world. So the, the, the book begins in the first sentence with a 14th century Moroccan scholar wandering around and commenting on how high living standards were in Bengal. And now think of yourself in the classroom as an Indian student and you suddenly see at the beginning of your economics textbook something about the place you live. For a student in Warwick, uh, a student uh, somewhere in the US, they're immediately being sensitized to something about the world they almost certainly didn't know, which was that for about a thousand years, there were very small differences in living standards across countries. So the world was really kind of flat, whereas now we experience these huge differences in living standards across countries, and that uh, creates uh, curiosity about how we got from this flat world to this hockey stick turning point and that's a good way of drawing students in. And we repeat that same uh, method, if you like, at the beginning of each of the 22 units in the, uh, the, eco the economy course free e-text. And so just take unit 22, where we try to motivate students about the question of democracy and the relationship between economics and politics by telling the life story of Cyril Ramaphosa, who, who is now the president of the African National Congress and will probably be the president of South Africa. And where did he start under apartheid? What happened when democracy came to South Africa? How did he then become the 26th richest person in Africa and, and a leading, uh, you know, likely to be heading, heading the government? So it's beginning with puzzles, with questions. In that case, we then say, OK, democracy came, but inequality in South Africa hasn't gone down. How do we understand that? Well, that, that it's stimulating curiosity. And I think that's what anyone teaching almost anything needs to do. And it had somehow got forgotten in much of the teaching of economics. Mm. And I mean, you mentioned obviously a lot of those examples from right around the world. So schools and students in India, political leaders in Africa. Obviously, the, I mean, the rest of the world is, from a American, European perspective, more important than ever. We're seeing huge amounts of growth in East Asia. Obviously, Africa is going to be a great source of yeah, change over the next 100 years. Mm. Is part of that new teaching of economics about actually including the rest of the world more? Really kind of getting to know different problems that affect different people in different parts of the world and how they all come together. Yes, I think that's part of the global perspective. And the, and the other element is, is speaking to and with a global audience of students. So we want students, wherever they are, 
to at some stage when they're working through the text and acquiring these tools of economics, to see themselves, to see themselves there. Mm -hmm. um, because seeing yourself gives you a much more concrete incentive when you're having to do what we all do, which is quite a bit of hard work in mastering uh, the tools and techniques that we need to study these different problems. And obviously a lot of your teaching is about, as you say, the teaching of I events, making what happens in the real world applicable to teaching. And one of the single biggest events of certainly my current lifetime, and I suspect yours as well, was the financial crisis of 2008. Now, in your speech, you mentioned that one reason it wasn't perhaps as bad as it might have been was that policymakers learnt the lessons of the last great crisis in the 1930s and applied them. So, building on that, what would you say the greatest lessons were from this crisis and how should they be applied in when we come to the next great global financial crisis? Fantastic question. Uh, and we, we, all of us, uh, researchers and students, that's what we should be working on. So we need to understand more fully the, the genesis of the crisis. We need to understand the response to the crisis. So the initial response is the one that I focused on. But then there was the phase of austerity which uh, I suggested there was some consensus that this was, this was too harsh. So somehow we'd learnt some lessons, but then we forgot some lessons. Uh, and one of the, uh, the, the big issues that we, that we need to understand now is uh, what is happening in the financial sector, how, 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 how should we understand the build-up of debt, and are the measures that have been taken to improve the safety of the banking system adequate to ensure us against uh, a financial crisis. But I think another lesson is that, and we, we, uh, we draw students into this in the text, is to recognize that there was a crisis in between the Great Depression and the financial crisis. And this was the, the crisis of inflation, the stagflation crisis of the, of the, uh, the 1970s. Completely different crisis. So all the attention, all the economics people were thinking about in the 50s and 60s, how do we avoid another Great Depression? We use interventionist uh, macroeconomic policy. But kind of sneaking up on them was a different problem, which was coming from the supply side and the forces that would generate uh, rising inflation. So increasing conflict uh, between employers and workers, workers uh, strengthened by years and years of low unemployment, pushing up inflation. And that kind of was a surprise. And uh, the, the lessons were then learned from that crisis. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, the found the, the, uh, led to the uh, shift towards independence for central banks and inflation targeting monetary policy. So you can see that, uh, that a crisis comes partly because we're not focusing on other developments in the economy. Mm -hmm. We respond to the crisis, improve institutions, calm for a couple of decades, and then we're somehow focusing on all of that, thinking how brilliant it was that we achieved the great moderation with fairly low and stable inflation, low unemployment, and didn't notice what was happening in the banking system. So I think the the more that we can help students to understand what's happened in the past, the more we can make them sensitive to uh, different sources of instability, then the more likely it is that we're going to be well placed to, uh, to anticipate and to mitigate uh, a crisis, another crisis when it occurs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just in, in your view, if there were to be the seeds of another crisis sown in the present day, where would they come from? Because some, some might say we haven't learned the lessons of the last crisis, that the policy of too big to fail, the insurement against default of banks still remains, that debt is now at higher levels than it was at just before the Great Recession. Obviously, there's things like Brexit that have introduced possible new shocks to the system. Mm -hmm. Any views on all of that? <laughs> uh, I, I do think there are still reasons to be concerned about the financial system and the financial sector. And I don't think that all the lessons that should have been learned from the financial crisis have been learned. So uh, what we should always be looking out for is 
not just the build-up of debt, but the build-up of debt in the banking system. And that would be a, a very serious uh, source of concern. So, exactly, I don't think it's the end of the story um, in terms of uh, making the financial system safer. Uh, I think that we have been rocked by these political shocks uh, in terms of um, Brexit is a, is a very good example. And uh, the, the, the likely consequences of that are not uh, abrupt like a financial crisis, but they're long-lived in terms of uh, a detrimental effect on living standards and the improvement in living standards for people in, in the UK. And I think one of our really important tasks is to, is to explain uh, why that is going to happen uh, and to uh, more broadly create a much, a much uh, greater uh, basis of understanding of economics among citizens so that they're not so easily uh, swayed by the latest soundbite that they see in the media. And is that going to help with, obviously, greater trust in economists? Because talking of Brexit, one big <coughs> feature of that was, well, Michael Goh's very famous, the Bridge People Had Enough of Experts statement, and we, we did see that sentiment, that people heard the consensus from economists and then refused to listen to it. Is that kind of, is that greater understanding in the populace the key to making sure that next time there's a warning, people actually listen? I think we, we need greater understanding, but we have to do something about that. And one of the, the uh, objectives of the core pro project is to, is to help with that, which is to change the way that economics is perceived by teaching a different kind of economics from the beginning. Uh, and this could go not just in universities, but also go down through the school system so that, uh, so that there isn't this sense of these completely disconnected experts saying things that with which ordinary people can't, can't connect. So we, we have to do things uh, in, in order to get the trust of citizens. Mm. And I think we've made a very good start to do that. Very good. OK. One, one final question here, just on one point of your speech that I found especially interesting, was your statement that in teaching economics, to create better economic students, we need people with an understanding of other social sciences, of history, even of evolutionary biology, which plays such a role in human behaviour. And the way we teach in the UK, in, in universities, mm. is very much focused on people choose a discipline at 18 and they, they stick with it, they take further courses in it, but they're very much confined within their stream. Do you think there are better ways of going about this, of making sure people get proper interdisciplinary exposure? I do. And I think, uh, so one step would, would be that students get, that everyone gets a better understanding of how the economy works at school level. And then I think uh, it would be very advantageous for students to come into a, a much broader palette of courses uh, in the first year. Mm. And one reason for this is that, uh, and there's a lot of work going on to, to develop evidence, is that it seems that we're missing out on a lot of women in economics because they're very put off when they have to make this, this decision uh, coming, in, uh, coming into university of what they're going to study. And women have, have appear to have been put off by the way economics is taught. What they do is, because we, we have data on their second choice, they tend to do things like psychology. Mm -hmm. And your, your proposal, uh, combined with mine, I think, would, would uh, create a much more balanced group of students studying economics mm. um, alongside other social sciences and also um, learning some of the, of the insights, but also some of the techniques from evolutionary biology as well. Well, we can only hope someone thinks to implement it sometime in the future then. Professor Carlin, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's a pleasure. I'm very optimistic. <laughs>